For many Christians, the concept of biological evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution, represents a very real threat, a very real concern, because this idea basically says that undirected chemical and biological processes generated the very first life forms and then caused these life forms to undergo transformations generating the diversity of life that we see throughout Earth's history. And this idea, this concept, seems to undermine the notion that Christians hold dear that a creator brought life into existence and orchestrated life's history for his purpose. And so it's important for Christians to know how to think about biological evolution because this is an idea that's not going to go away. It's the prevailing view among the scientific community to explain life's origin and life's history. And one of the first things that you need to do in terms of being able to competently think about the concept of evolution is to understand what scientists mean when they use the term evolution. Now, in the most general sense, evolution simply means change with respect to time, change that happens over time. And that concept in and of itself is not intrinsically challenging uh, to the Christian faith. But when it comes to change over time applied to biological systems, there's different types of change that fall under the umbrella of this term known as evolution. And what we are going to discover is that some of these uh, concepts really don't represent a challenge to the notion of God as creator, whereas others do. So for example, I believe that there are five different categories of biological change that again could be uh, termed evolution. And I'm going to refer to them as microevolution, speciation, microbial evolution, macroevolution, and chemical evolution. Now, three of these aspects of the evolutionary paradigm really don't represent a fundamental problem to the Christian faith. That would again be microevolution, speciation, and microbial evolution, whereas chemical evolution and macroevolution do represent challenges to the notion of God as creator. Now, what do these different terms mean? Well, for example, a microevolution simply refers to variation that happens within a species in response to changes in the environment, changes in competitive and predatory pressures. It even can refer to just random processes that would be referred to by scientists as genetic drift. Uh, microevolution does not create a new species, but rather allows a species to adapt to changes again in its environment or to changes in the competitive environment it's, it's in or predatory pressures it experiences. Another type of evolution that, again, I don't believe to be a challenge to the Christian faith is speciation. This is a process in which microevolution happens over a significant period of time where parts of the population become isolated from each other, and as a consequence, those two populations begin to assume different characteristics and different features. But there's nothing radical that's happening here in terms of evolutionary mechanisms being able to create anything genuinely new. Uh, instead, it's a single species branching into two closely related sister species that are very much th the same in many respects, though they differ enough to be considered different species. Now, another type of evolution that I don't believe is problematic to the Christian faith is microbial evolution. Evolution that happens among viruses and bacteria and organisms that would be referred to as single-cell eukaryotes, like amoeba and paramecium, for example. Uh, the malaria parasite would be this type of organism. It's very clear from the scientific evidence that microorganisms can evolve Again, there's nothing radical that's happening. These are still organisms that are viruses, bacteria, uh, single-celled eukaryotes that really don't even change their character much. They, 
they, they still would be considered to be, in a sense, the same species, but they're able to undergo evolutionary change just because of the sheer population size of these single-celled entities. The, the population sizes are vast in number in nature, and because of those very large population sizes, even random events are going to stumble upon beneficial mutations, beneficial advantages, allowing these organisms to evolve. What we would be concerned about as Christians when it comes to this concept of evolution is when scientists claim that evolution has genuine creative power, genuine creative potential. Uh, so, for example, the origin of life or chemical evolution or abiogenesis, these are all three terms that mean more or less the same thing, refers to this process in which a complex chemical mixture underwent a, a series of transformations generating the very first cells, the very first life forms. And this particular idea basically says that nature can create complex living entities from simple molecules all on its own. This is ascribing to the evolutionary process genuine creative power and potential and, and leaves no room for a creator's role in that process. And so this would be an idea that fundamentally challenges the notion of the Christian faith that again, a creator is necessary for life to be possible. And then another concept that again is, is problematic would be macroevolution. This is the idea that again, evolution can transform one major biological group into another. Some common examples would be dinosaurs evolving into, bir evolving into birds, uh, wolf-like creatures evolving into whales, or apes, or ape-like creatures evolving into human beings. Uh, this again, this concept represents a real challenge to the Christian faith. And again, the notion that God has orchestrated life's history because this idea says that life's history, the diversity of life throughout the history of life on earth can be explained through unguided, undirected evolutionary mechanisms. Now, what we're gonna find is that there is overwhelming evidence for microevolution, speciation, and microbial evolution, but when it comes to chemical evolution or the origin of life, and when it comes to macroevolution, there we see uh, real significant scientific challenges to these ideas. And, and so knowing what is being referred to when scientists talk about evolution is helpful in making sense, again, of the evolutionary paradigm, learning how to think about it. But one thing that we all have to be careful about as we're looking at the evidence for evolution is to not allow yourself to be sucked into what I'll, I'll call the shell game of evolution. Oftentimes, because of the overwhelming evidence for microevolution, speciation, and microbial evolution, scientists will point to those types of evidence and say, look, evolution is a fact, and then apply that evidence to concepts like chemical evolution and macroevolution. So, for example, scientists might say, look at the peppered moth. Uh, when the pollution in the environment increased, the peppered moth population went from primarily white wing varieties to black wing varieties. See, evolution is a fact. And then they would say, because evolution is a fact, we can be confident that an ape-like creature over the span of seven million years evolved through a series of transitional forms to produce the very first human beings. You see what's going on here is that they are using evidence for microevolution, variation within a species, to validate a concept that falls under the umbrella of macroevolution. So don't allow yourself to be sucked into the shell game of evolution. Evidence for microevolution is evidence for just that, microevolution. And to justify human evolution, there are certain scientific criteria that must be met independently of the evidence for microevolution, speciation, and microbial evolution.